morning. This seems like old times. It's been a while since we pre-recorded a sermon. I hope we don't have to get back into that happening again, but it's uh, good to have the option when we can't meet together. I hope all of you had a good Thanksgiving. This morning, what I want to do is just take a short look at three passages. And uh, tying these three passages together will then serve as our meditation to prepare us to take the Lord's Supper together. So, uh, the first passage that I want to look at with you is from Ephesians chapter 1. And this is actually one of the prayers that we looked at a few months ago as we were uh, focusing on several of the prayers of the Apostle Paul. But there's just one thing in this prayer that I want to focus on this morning. Let me begin reading in verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. I'll stop right there. Notice that, that Paul is praying that his readers would receive the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and that their eyes would be enlightened so that they would better understand three things. Uh, he mentions in verse 18 that they would know what is the hope of his calling and then what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and then third, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? Just think with me about that second thing there, that he wants us to better understand. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I don't know if you remember from uh, the lesson where we looked at this passage, <clears throat> but the inheritance that... Paul is talking about right here is not the inheritance that we will receive. Now, he does mention that earlier in this same context. In uh, verse 13, he mentions that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And in verse 14, he, he says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee or the down payment that he has given to us of the inheritance that will ultimately be ours. All that God has in store for us later on in the new earth, after Jesus returns and makes everything right, that's our inheritance, and Paul names that back in verse 14. What he's praying here that we would understand, though, is something different. This is his inheritance. God's inheritance. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What Paul is saying is that believers, you and I, are the inheritance that God is looking forward to possessing. Now, that's an astonishing thought. And it's... Uh, it's something that we truly do need, the spirit of revelation, to enlighten our minds in order to grasp that God would actually treasure us that much, that we are the inheritance he looks forward to possessing throughout all eternity. And yet that's what Paul is saying right here. The second passage I want to look at is in John chapter 17. This is from the prayer that Jesus offered the night of his betrayal. And I'll just read verses 22 through 24. 
He says, speaking to the Father, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, referring to his disciples, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Notice verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Notice just a couple of things there from verse 24. One of the things that was on Jesus' mind the night before his crucifixion was his desire for his disciples to be with him after he returns to the Father. That they would be with him, that they would be able to see his glory and to share in that glory with him throughout all eternity. But notice also this little phrase in verse 24 that would be easy to overlook. He says, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. That they whom you have given me. Have you ever thought about the fact that you are God's gift to his son? Disciples are those whom the Father has given to his Son. You've heard the expression, God don't make no junk. Well, it's also true that God doesn't give lousy gifts. So what does it say about how much he treasures us that we are the Father's gift to the Son that he loves? So, we are the possession, the, the inheritance that he looks forward to enjoying throughout all eternity. We are the Father's gift to the Son. And the Son is longing to be with us throughout all eternity, to share his glory with us. And then the last passage that I want us to look at is Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> We'll just read the first two verses. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Again, I want to just focus in on one little phrase here in this passage. The joy set before him. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. The Gospels, of course, make it very clear that uh, Jesus laid down his life voluntarily. In John 10, he told his disciples that no one would take his life from him. That he would lay it down of his own initiative. Uh, you remember when Peter drew his sword and started swinging to defend Jesus when the crowd came out to arrest him. Jesus told Peter to put away his sword and, and asked him, Don't you realize that if I were to ask the Father, he would immediately send more than 12 legions of angels to defend me? Jesus was not forced to go to the cross. Jesus volunteered to lay down his life. But why did he do that? What was it that motivated him to remain on that cross, enduring all of that suffering. And remember, it wasn't just the physical pain. It was more importantly the spiritual suffering that he endured as he was going through the separation from the Father as he bore the, the sins of the world on his shoulders. What motivated him to do that? Well, of course, on the one hand, there was his desire to please the Father. 
Paul talks about that in Philippians 2 when he says that Jesus became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So certainly uh, one major factor that held Jesus on the cross was his great desire to please the Father, to be obedient to God's call. But on the other hand, in light of the passages that we've just looked at in Ephesians and John 17, it's also true to say that what motivated Jesus to go through that suffering was his desire to be with you and me. And I think that's what the Hebrews writer has in mind when he says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus had such a great desire for his disciples, including you and me, to be with him throughout all eternity, that he was willing to go to the cross in order to make that possible, because that truly was the only way. He had to deal with our sin. It's an astonishing thought to consider that God, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, treasure us that much that we are the Father's gift to Jesus, that we are the inheritance that Jesus longs to possess, uh, that we were the joy that he had his eyes fixed on when he went to the cross that motivated him to endure such shame and suffering. So with that in mind, let's... Uh, Read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray for the bread. Lord, the depth of your love for us is truly something that we need a revelation from your spirit to understand. That you long to be with us throughout eternity, that you were willing to go to the cross in order to make that possible. It's almost too much for us to take in. Thank you, Lord, for the price that you paid to redeem us. We take this bread to remember you and to glorify you. Amen. pray for the cup. Lord, thank you for enduring the cross for our sake. Thank you for this cup, the new covenant in your blood. We drink it in your honor. Amen. 